So we finished talking about Mrs. Gren and how we can use Mrs. Gren as a mnemonic to help us to remember the seven life processes. So now you're going to learn another mnemonic and it has to do with remembering the order, order that the taxa happen in. So I just use the illusion that Mrs. Gren has a nephew. His name is King Philip of Spain. He likes spaghetti. So we can use the mnemonic, did King Philip come over for good spaghetti? Okay. Did King Philip come over for good spaghetti? And that helps us to remember the seven taxa. Now on here we have eight. And the reason why we have eight is because I've included domain as the top one. Okay, but um, if you start with kingdom at the top, then you have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Okay, so the reason why you remember, did King Philip come over for good spaghetti? The reason why you memorize the blue is so that it can help you remember the order of the red. So while you may be able to remember all of these, it's important that you know the actual um, sequence that they happen in because the sequence is important. Like for example, domain is at the top because domain is the most, most uh, encompassing and species is at the bottom is because it's uh, the most specific. So the way that it works out is that there's many species in a genus and there's many genuses in a family. There's many families that make up an order. There's many orders that make up a class. There's very many uh, classes that make up a phylum. And there are many phylum that make up a kingda, kingdom. And there's multiple kingdoms that may make up a domain. So if you were to classify a human being, this is how you would classify them. So you would say that they belong to domain eukarya or eukaryota. You would say that they belong to the kingdom animalia, which means that they're animals, they're heterotrophic and they're multicellular. They're, they belong to phylum chordata, which means that they have a notochord when they're developing um, as a fetus. They belong to class mammalia, which means that they give birth to live young and they have hair on their skin. They belong to order primates, which means they have opposable thumbs, family hominidae, genus homo, and species is sapiens. So when you're referring to the scientific name for humans, you say homo sapiens. That's the genus and species names put together. All right, so when we want to name something uh, that's living, we give it a name based on binomial nomenclature. Nomenclature means uh, a system for naming and binomial means to provide two. So when you're naming something that's living, you give it two scientific names or the one scientific name is made up of two components. So um, if you could imagine the reason why we would do this is because some living things, depending on where you are in the world, could be given different common names. So for example, this one fish here, uh, it may appear in one area of the world and people refer to it as a sea mullet, whereas in other places in the world, they may call it a flathead mullet. So they may think, some people, if they call it by a different name, they may think that it's an actually uh, different fish, but really it could be the same one because oftentimes we have the similar uh, or different names for a similar thing. So for example, like a book bag, you can, some people call it a book bag, some people call it a kit bag. Um, so it depends on where you are and what you call it. So these are four names that are given to this one fish when its actual scientific name is really Mugal cephalus. Okay, the scientific name is right here. The genus is Mugal. The species is cephalus. Okay, Mugal cephalus. So there's only one Mugal cephalus in the world and it's this fish. Uh, the genus name has an uppercase letter and the species name always has a lowercase letter. All right, so we use uh, these things called dichotomous keys in order to help us in identifying the scientific names of different animals uh, or even plants or basically anything that's living. So many times uh, people who are out in the woods, they could use a dichotomous key if they're wondering what type of tree they're looking at. So if you have a dichotomous key on you, it would ask you questions like, uh, does the tree have broad leaves versus narrow leaves? Is the leaf venation uh, netted or um, is it parallel to the leaves? They may ask, are the needles flat or are the needles round? So basically what happens in a dichotomous key is you're given two options which you have to choose from. Uh, so for example, if we were looking at these birds here um, and you were trying to classify what their names were, so obviously they have uh, some different characteristics with regards to their beaks. So say we were looking at bird W, uh, we would use this dichotomous key to figure out what the bird's uh, genus name is.
So you start with number one. You say, uh, well, the beak is either relatively long and slender or the beak is relatively stout and heavy. So you have to decide which of the two probably applies and look at the rest of them and see what they look like. This one here looks to be long and slender. The other ones seem to be short and heavy, stout and heavy. So I would say that bird W has a beak that's stout and heavy. So if it does, that means you go to question two. So looking at question two, it says the bottom surface of the lower beak is flat and straight or the bottom surface of the lower beak is curved. So to me, these bottom beaks are curved whereas this one's slightly curved and this one's flat. So to me, this is uh, the bottom surface of the lower beak is curved, uh, or sorry, is flat and straight. So this genus name of this bird would be Geospeza. Now I know that these are genus names because they start with uppercase letters. If they were lowercase names, then I, then I, upper, lowercase letters, then I know that they would be uh, species names. So if I was doing bird Y, I would go back to the beginning and I'd ask myself the same question. So this one is Geospeza. Uh, bird Y, the beak is relatively long and slender. True. Okay, so this is a Certhidia. All right, if I was doing a bird X, uh, the beak is relatively stout and heavy. Go to two. The bottom surface of the lower beak is flat and straight. No, the bottom surface of the lower beak is curved. So I'd go to three. The lower edge of the upper beak has a distinct bend. The lower edge of the upper beak is mostly flat. So the lower edge of the top beak is this part here. It's pretty flat. This is the one that's bent. Okay. So bird X must be uh, this one right here. And bird Z is the one with the bend. Sorry, the one with the bend is this one. And the one that's flat is the platyspeza. So you're able to use a dichotomous key in order to figure out what the scientific names are of things. So you could even make your own dichotomous key if you wanted to. Uh, say you were looking at these creatures right here. Um, one of the first questions that you could probably write down would be, does the creature have eyes or not? And that basically divides the group into two. So you have these ones here with eyes, and then you have the other ones without eyes. And then maybe you say, yes, if they do have eyes, uh, go to step two and no they do not have eyes go to step three and so you continue to ask yourself questions eventually you'll be able to figure out what the name of each character is so you're going to do practice um, on being able to use dichotomous keys to verify uh, different species or just fun ones like different creatures being able to determine what their scientific names are all right so we're moving into monorins and if you recall uh, what we had said before about the different classifications of animals, we were saying that there's uh, two ways, two naming systems, or two classification systems. You can either group by domain, where there's three domains, um, or you can group by kingdoms. So if you group by kingdoms, uh, this group right here, the eukaryotes, has been divided further into four groups. All right, so the archaea bacteria and new bacteria, so basically bacteria all together are referred to as monorins. So if you're using the three domain system, the monorins comprise two of the groups. And if you're talking about the six kingdom system, the monorins comprise two of the six groups. All right, so the monorins are going to be prokaryotic, single celled, and they can be auto or heterotrophic. All right, so moving on to our monorins. Uh, the monorins are basically any type of bacteria. The eubacteria are considered to be the true bacteria. They are usually the ones that cause some type of illness or infection, like Staphylococcus or Campylobacter. Uh, archaeobacteria are typically older bacteria that can withstand very extreme conditions. So for example, like hot temperatures in volcanoes, cold temperatures in glaciers, they could have a low pH, so they exist in acidic environments. And the last one that's here is that they could live in an anaerobic environment. Anaerobic means that they live in an environment that has no oxygen. And usually organisms use oxygen for cellular respiration, so that's why it's considered to be extreme. All right, so monorins, uh, which are bacteria, they tend to have one of three different shapes. They can either be sphere-shaped, they can be rod-shaped, or they can be spiral-shaped. So if the monorin is sphere-shaped, usually they put cocci or coccus in the name of the bacteria. So for example, Staphylococcus, that type of bacteria exists in uh, small spheres. So they can either be like singular spheres, they can be paired up, they can be in groups of four, they can be in chains, or they can be in big clusters, which is what you see over here. This is a cluster of spheres. Um, so if it's a sphere, we name it with uh, the suffix caucus. 
If it's rod shaped, we use the uh, suffix bacilli or bacillus. So these ones can be either singular, so one rod, they could be paired rods or they can be chains of rods. Um, and then the last one would be a spiral shape. So if they are spiral shape, usually spirali is at the end of the name. So here's an example of a bacteria that's spiral shaped. So those are the three types of shapes they tend to use. There's also colors that we use to distinguish bacteria with as well. All right, so the structure of a monarin, basically most of these you could probably figure out on your own. Um, essentially what I want you to do is I want, I'll go over this in class with you. We'll do a labeling uh, activity where I give you the sheet and you label it yourself. What I'd like you to do is research. You'll probably be able to find this picture online somewhere. Just put in a structure of a monarin or bacteria and be able to figure out where all these terms go. So capsule would be the outer surface. The flagellum is the tail basically that makes it move around. Uh, there's the cell wall. There's cytoplasm, a cell membrane, ribosome, DNA, nucleoid, and plasmid. So most of these things you've seen before. All right, so all bacteria have a choice of reproducing either sexually or asexually. Some only produce sexually and some only produce asexually. So uh, a method of sexually reproducing through binary fission. Okay, binary fission is an asexual method of reproduction. All that happens is uh, the mother cell will split into two daughter cells. So the, the DNA of these daughter cells is the exact same as the DNA that was in the parent cell. So these Cells here are essentially clones of the initial cell. Binary fission is asexual. You don't need to have sex in order to reproduce. You go from having one to two without any sex occurring. And so this is called binary fission. So this is the asexual method of reproduction for monorins. And if you talk about monorins reproducing sexually, what they would do is the two monorins would come close together. This cytoplasmic extension is made and it crosses over. It's called a pilus. So it reaches over across and that's like a basically like a little bridge where this plasmid DNA goes across into the other um, monorin and then you're able to exchange DNA. So when you exchange DNA, that's sexually, sexual reproduction. So humans, they reproduce sexually because what happens is the sperm's DNA and the egg's DNA, when they meet, they basically um, exchange uh, between one another and they mix up their DNA. So you have a mixture of one another's DNA. So here there's no mixture of DNA. You just copy it and here there is. So this one is considered sexual. This one's considered asexual. So the asexual method is called binary fission and the sexual method is called conjugation.